This is some quite dangerous stuff mm -hmm. because we're looking at people's brains and it's literally changing them. It wasn't always this way. <laughs> and the way in which, you know, the technology and behavioral science and behavioral economics has kind of all come together to create this perfect storm. This algorithm made this hyper personalized experience for you and sort of has started to rewire people's brains. I would argue that we have a greater concern over privacy yeah. and that the younger generation, like my students, for example, this is a hot topic in most of our seminars um, across the modules I teach. Most of them don't care. They're just not bothered about privacy. The, the surprise kind of illustrates the lack of understanding of the echo chamber. And so then they create these micro communities and then they feed them more of this content. We woke up to the front page of the Times saying, big brands fund terror. Welcome to Digital Health Diagnosed, your dose of tech wellbeing, hosted by me, Dr. Rachel Kent, lecturer in digital economy and society at King's College London and founder of Dr. Digital Health. This podcast is here to help you identify how technology might harm your health in some way. And we provide you tips and strategies to give you tools to have a better relationship with your digital world in your everyday life. This week, we're talking about behavioural science and the ways in which the apps that we use and the platforms we use uh, shape and inform the decisions that we make, particularly around the consumer choices, what kind of products and services we might buy online, and how digital marketing ultimately forecloses decision making for us or pushes us towards certain outcomes. So I'm thrilled today to be joined by Henry Arkill, who is co-founder of Malena, a boutique uh, marketing and media consultancy based in London. And Henry, you've been working in digital marketing for about 15, 16 years now, and have worked with some of the biggest uh, and top brands and have really kind of seen that arc and shift in how uh, the big tech giants have started using digital marketing to monetize and make a lot of money. And you really have a huge amount of expertise and that historical perspective uh, to what we've all been living through the last kind of 15 years. So Henry, thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. Um, so firstly, in your extensive experience, um, can you just give the listeners an overview um, of how the agendas of the tech giants um, have been a real driving force for a lot of the shifts that we've seen in society for the last 15 years, kind of both in and outside of marketing um, and retail as well. Yeah, great. So um, I think we, we've talked about this before yeah. uh, quite, quite extensively, but um, uh, ultimately since about 2009, I started predominantly working with Facebook and it was before I had an account. And then it was a lot of fun. You know, you were a young 20 something in a room in Shoreditch um, uh, doing marketing on this brand new cool platform that everyone was really excited about. And of course, what was driving that in the background was um, the need for these companies to IPO uh, and to make a lot of money. And Facebook had a problem back then. And I'm going to focus on Facebook for now because I think uh, actually Google in itself, in terms of people just expressing something to search for something and f finding it back, um, it is a useful tool. But yeah, so so Facebook had a challenge, which was um, the value of the IPO was determined by how many users they had, which they were doing really, really well on. Uh, and also the amount of time that was spent on the platform, which they weren't doing well on. So anyone that played games like Farmville, et cetera, you had this cohort of people that would spend oh, hours Farmville. a day. Yeah, Farmville, <laughs> remember the Nostalgia. days. Uh, 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 yeah, f four or so hours a day on the platform, but that was a small cohort and then everyone else was not was going on there daily, but they weren't spending a lot of time. So then um, Facebook decided or developed the newsfeed. So before the newsfeed, there was essentially everyone's content that you had um, were friends with or the pages you subscribed to would just come in a feed. And then they started filtering that out. And at the time, there was uproar amongst users and it was in the press. Oh God, this is horrific. How are you filtering out? How are you having this control over this? This is my Facebook. This is my personalized experience. Mm. And quickly the time started to go up and then quickly Facebook started to tweak it. And then a couple of years later, uh, Twitter followed suit and then they started filtering out the tweets and started to personalize these the, 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 these platforms. And so I think ultimately the, 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 the biggest shift we saw was the rise of the algorithm, which people often sort of, you can just type it in and there's loads of conspiracy theories or the latest news on how it works. And so this algorithm made this hyper-personalized experience for you 
and um, and sort of has started to rewire people's brains. Now, commercially, for me, as somebody who's working with brands to try and shift behavior, fucking gold. <laughs> uh, I'm there laughing, going, okay, great. You can put a TV advert on and, you know, that's great. People become aware of something. But if I put the same amount of money on uh, Facebook or on Twitter, wow, I can actually change behavior. And I think one of the uh, worked with a very well-known American coffee giant. And um, we did some things on Twitter. Um, and uh, I didn't we did, I didn't really expect it to sort of have this huge impact. And then outside their stores on the way into work, I sort of went past eight stores. And uh, there were queues of people outside. And this is for just one little thing that you've done. And you started to then, I started to then realize, and this was back in 2012, wow, this stuff is really powerful. This has got and some, so yeah, influence. And so you can influence and change people's behavior. And then actually, I suppose some of the things we'll explore today is how that happens mm -hmm. and what is going on in our brains when we're, we're, we're consuming this hyper-personalized content. Yeah, I think because it's important to give that kind of historic context because that's where we're living now is in that hyper-personalized space. But I think to strip back what's actually happening, which we'll do over the course of today's conversation, but to remember that it wasn't always this way <laughs> and the way in which, you know, the technology and behavioral science and behavioral economics has kind of all come together to create this perfect storm of an amazing environment for a few people to make a huge amount of money yeah. um, or a very interesting way to kind of be creative with marketing, I suppose. And we'll talk about some, you've got some fantastic examples to run through. Um, before we get into that, can you just, for like the everyday listener, explain what behavioral marketing, behavioral science in digital marketing is? Yeah, so um, at a very simple sense, if you went on a website, and it said, uh, and you've got the ratings and reviews, and it says 500 people gave this 4.7 stars. That demonstrates popularity. So sort of social proof. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a behavioral bias where you go, oh, wow, that's popular. It's a bit like when you go to Greece and you're walking down to find a nice restaurant and there's two restaurants next to each other. One's empty, one's full you're not going to want to go and eat in the one that's yeah. empty because it's just n not, n you, you, you get nervous. And so our bias is to sort of follow the crowd. So that's an example of one behavioral bias, but there's lots of these. So there's things like the power of now. So to go, oh, wow, you can get free delivery. That would be a great thing. You see free delivery on a website or on an advert, and it's actually a bias for you to go, oh, I can get something free. <laughs> and I special, uh, or points or, um, uh, next day delivery, all of these things are sort of biases that we would use, but you would usually indicate sort of popularity. Uh, you, you can use price. So you could use a price message. If something's expensive, then um, uh, you tend to think it's higher quality. So if you put the same perfume in, I've worked in beauty for a while, if you put the same perfume in front of two panels of people and you tell them, oh, this perfume's worth uh, 50 pounds, and then you put the, exactly the same perfume next to them and you say, oh, this is worth 100 pounds, the people that thought it was worth 100 pounds will say it smells nicer, it's more for them. Yeah. And, and so there's just these things. And essentially, they're sort of shortcuts in our brain. So if we think of our brain as sort of our monkey reptilian brain the original brain and then our sort of conscious brain that sits on uh, outside our brains making these shortcuts and so it's behavioral biases really sort of tap into that unconscious decision making that you do and advertisers use this i don't think in a in a particularly malicious way mm -hmm. it's just essentially a message test yeah but um we sort of termed it as behavioral biases and i think the apps and sort of digital apps have maybe use this and again um, hijack this with sort of the reward centers of your brain you know a notification you want to know what's happening oh um validation because wow um i've had so many likes on my mm -hmm. content and certainly speaking to say teenage relatives you know they'll be like oh i posted this picture but i took it down because i didn't get so many likes in this amount of time that's a real thing right isn't it yeah. the younger generation is like not having enough likes on it and yeah it's, yeah. yeah and so i guess that's not enough of a reward so then you then that prompts the removal of that and then however you're representing yourself online is shifted because of those reward centers yeah and, and there's yeah. the comparison thing so i think mm -hmm. on a on a human level if we strip it right back and we go well why why did social media become so popular the internet was around for a long time mm. um, and I suppose before social media the internet was quite a one-way thing 
um, I knew needed to know what I was looking for and Google came along and helped me find those things or I went in to sort of um, consume data and and being sort of yeah a, a 40 something myself then you remember ISN messenger or MSN messenger sorry and you used to go on and chat to your friends and that was really good and I, I seemed to every night after yeah. school <laughs> hours yeah. like, and, and no one could use the phone obviously yeah you can <laughs> the, the, the dial up yeah um but but ultimately what, what was that about that was about you know identity and belonging and talking mm -hmm. to your friends and when myspace came along uh which we all forget about now but yeah myspace and, and then facebook we suddenly found a way to exist in this digital world whereas before it had a function it was quite a functional place uh yeah i would work there and i could read information there but i wasn't necessarily using it mm -hmm. now i could express myself i could be i could have an identity i could belong to something i could find groups of people that uh, that i wanted to spend time with in this space and that, and then as a result we've seen that sort of rocket up mm -hmm. in terms of the time spent on the internet and the yeah. stats are scary yeah do you have any stats oh, in God. terms of like <laughs> <laughs> just put you on the spot because I was reading something recently about the amount of time we're spending on our phones and this was from like Statistica so like you mm. know reputable kind of um, research centre which was saying like somewhere between I think it was around like two to three hours a day for uh, the younger generation but I feel like that's probably quite conservative I would imagine it to be a lot higher and I just wondered if you knew of anything Yeah I'm or... um, not off the top of my head Rachel, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm happy because we've got some great consumer research tools in my company so uh, I can pull that data but yeah certainly when we were back um gosh in 2016 2017 when i've sort of last had a huge grasp on the data i should know now um the people spending like younger generations eight nine hours uh on their phones yeah. plus and so yeah i think the two hours is under but i'll come yeah. back to you yeah 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 stats. no i just would be very interested to know if there's anything more kind of recent um can you just explain um a little bit about so you've kind of given a little bit of an overview on like behavioral economics and behavioral biases and how the monetization process is entwined in that because i think it's such an interesting thing when we think back to how say instagram or uh Facebook was pre the advertising kind of getting involved in the platform and obviously changing the algorithm and the personalization. Um, and I think one of the things that I, um, in my work, uh, like to focus on, and also with my students as well, is to chat with particularly the younger generation to recognize, well, can they discern what is something that's kind of paid for, as in somebody that is being promoting a product or service via Instagram, for example, versus somebody that's not. And their kind of inability to do so, I think, is that I find very ethically dubious. Mm. Um, but it would be really interesting to hear from you a little bit about how the monetization process works, particularly in digital marketing. Great. So um, uh, ultimately, if we think about the platforms, which we all think as a product uh, in themselves, they're not the product. We're the product and our attention is the product. So going back to the example about um, Facebook's IPO and getting to and de developing the algorithm to get people to spend more time that was so essentially you could get a, a larger share of people's attention mm -hmm. um, that you could monetize with advertising and so um, we became the product essentially and um, the monetization process is quite simple um, it used to be a, more, a lot more complex, um, but essentially uh, you buy the space in Facebook or Instagram or on, say, Google, when you search for something, you buy if someone clicks. So, um, so yeah, essentially um, on Google, you choose whatever words or whatever audience that you want to select. So mm -hmm. the, the, the big platforms have a lot of data. Uh, and that data can be sort of the user could have volunteered, the consumer uh, could have volunteered that data um, or that data is being collected on you uh, by the platforms in some sense. So that could be something like they'll know what phone you have and how many times you open it and what other apps you have and how many times you message certain people because mm -hmm. it has these permissions. And so that will then be used to create a profile around you. So uh, you, Rachel, will have a profile around you um, which uh, the plat uh, which the social platforms were called a social graph. Okay, academia would call it a digital double. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, great, a digital yeah. double. And so, um, so um, your social graph then gets profiled, and then what happens is, as an advertiser, I can say, "Great, I'm selling a car, and I would like people to." 
uh, watch this video and I'd like people to come and book a test drive. And then um, you put the adverts live to people and then um, people see the adverts and they watch it and that sends signals back. And then the platform goes, oh, wow, people like these people will are more likely to watch the video or mm. more likely to come onto the website and book a test drive. So great, we're going to show these adverts to those people. And for us as advertisers, you know, you want to um, maximize the return for the money you put in. So say you're, you've got a hundred thousand pounds, you've got a target on that to say, okay, great. I'd like a, a 10,000 test drive bookings for this, this money. And so when then these digital platforms can then become more targeted by profiling the types of people that do it and then and then directing the other adverts that you're buying towards those people, it becomes more efficient. Mm -hmm. So then instead of 10,000 test drive bookings, you get 20,000 and you go, wow. And then, and then the advertiser goes, wow, isn't, isn't, isn't Facebook or isn't Twitter or isn't Google great? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll give them more money. Yeah. And so, so the, the monetization process, I think is, is relatively straightforward. I think the thing with it is, do consumers really know what's going on behind it? And, and coming back to your question around are the adverts distinguished enough? Mm -hmm. There's been some times where, gosh, back in certainly 2010 to 2014, all the adverts we used to run on social media platforms would say underneath, your friend likes this brand. Yes, I And so that. they would be using and harnessing people's names mm -hmm. and they're making their data public to essentially do, going back to the behavioral bias, yeah. demonstrate social proof. And so that would then make the adverts stand out more. And then uh, we would then see the brands or the consumers would then see the brands in the real world and go, oh yeah, I remember that advert more. So um, uh, that was removed. Um, and there's been um, a lot of debate around whether people do know, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of criticism of social media platforms, whether let's call them native content. So by that, I mean, essentially, I could go on and create a post on social media or an advertiser could create a post and the advert would be native because it looks just like the content on the platform so it's a bit like when you're reading a newspaper mm -hmm. and you see there's an advertorial they're called them and you yes. can distinctly see maybe the font type's just different about, yeah but but it's it. made to look like an article but you sort of know because the style is different mm -hmm. now the, the digital platforms have deployed very different formats and then slowly over time they've integrated it into the experience mm -hmm. because they want it to be one singular experience and yes there might be a little button which says sponsored yeah um but can our brains determine and distinguish between the pieces of content probably not yeah and it's i think thinking about it from that kind of commercial capitalist lens and the inability to discern, I think there are a lot of harms that can come in, particularly when there's content that's circulating that is particularly harmful to health. And I'm talking here about, we've had uh, Sophie Medlin on uh, as one of our first guests talking about the harms on diets through influencer culture and those kind of horrible vitamin drip things and, mm. and all of that stuff. But because it's a lifestyle post and because they like that individual, because, you know, whoever's following that content wants some guidance or want some information or they just look up to that person and they think, well, they're doing that, so I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. The harms that can actually impact society are massive and we've spoken quite a lot on the podcast about that so far. But one thing we haven't discussed, which I'd love to chat to you about, is the harms in terms of the political side of stuff and Ooh. the polarisation that we spoke about earlier this week because um, Henry kindly came on to my module at King's um, and did a, a guest lecture for my students, which was amazing and gave some really interesting insights into the data capture side of stuff, the profiling, and we spoke a bit about Cambridge Analytica and Brexit and Trump. And could you just provide a little brief kind of insight from your expertise on what happened there on that side? Oh, gosh. Um, if you're allowed. Yeah, I did. No, no, no. I've got, I'm, I'm allowed to luckily, luckily work for myself these days. <laughs> um, so I, I suppose to put this in context um, and looking back at the past I've had in social media and 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 the, there's there's lots of people there's probably about 200 of us that used to do this in in London we used to build apps on Facebook and it would be great things like oh where have you been in the world and oh what's my favorite song or great oh how many guardian articles have i re read etc and we build these apps 
and uh, uh, if people can remember if they're of the age, you used to download the app and it would sort of plug into your Facebook experience and then you'd have to accept the terms and conditions, uh, which would be don't allow, allow. And they those permissions would be, I'm going to give you access to my name, my address, my birthday. I'm going to give you permission to email me. This was before the um, the data privacy law, GDPR came along where there was a lot, a lot more restrictions on, on, on email. But you could also just hand over all your friends data as well yeah. so anything then any friend that had then connected with you you could just say yeah yeah um give give everything and so we used to build these apps and um and then harvest this data and then stick it on a hard drive and give it to an actual hard drive a saying. physical hard drive yeah. and i remember cycling around L london and sort of put, put putting data on hard drives or on, on pens and um yeah handing it over to companies because the sort of attitude towards data we didn't really know we didn't know as professionals what we were doing um and it was all above board and legal back then mm. um now we've looked back on it and go oh my god you couldn't you couldn't do this but i suppose the data was flowing around so there's 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 lots of data from these apps and um i think actually sort of the the brands and the advertisers which were doing it were doing it with sort of um yeah w without a malicious intent mm -hmm. they were doing it to find out more insights about their customers or to discover who else who would like to engage with their brand but there were lots of people that were building apps which maybe weren't so uh so so, so so good and lots of companies then selling that data which is i think how we then landed on say cambridge analytica having a huge profile of people's data um and most of it, the data was benign. I remember working with a sort of very posh supermarket and showing them some of the sort of the data things. And I was in this big room in front of a sort of very well-to-do marketing director. And we were going, great, look, uh, social media is so brilliant. We can find out people who like your supermarket also like. And then the first thing was wanking to songs of praise. And so you go, okay, that's that's maybe wow. maybe not what we want. And the, 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 room, the room burst, burst out wow. in laughter. So, so like, how useful is that? No, but you know, there's a bit of comedy. There's a bit of uh, and 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 so this data, but though, is very powerful because then if you go, okay, well, it's actually people that have humour, or we can you yeah. can drill down into this data, you can find out a lot of things about people. Yeah. And so Cambridge Analytica obviously um, got hold of some of this data mm -hmm. because by then, of course, um, Meta had pulled back a lot of these things and successfully used the 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 social media platforms to and primarily facebook to create groups to target particular people um to influence elections and then i know there's lots of things in terms of uh and it's a very western view isn't it it's like russian state actors yeah. iranian state actors well i'm sure the british government and the american government are equally doing it yeah uh, and the political party so i suppose there's there's um people going on to platforms and using this data to profile people and use it and target in particular ways and that's that's uh that in power with the algorithm means that when people then start to engage with that content mm -hmm they start to get more content. And so I'm sure you talked about the concept of an echo chamber. We have. Yeah, yeah. great. So, so, so echo chambers in terms of, oh, great, the platforms want to keep you on. They want to make their platform sticky and keep you on there. So when you then engage with the content, it then goes, great, we'll show you more of this content. I think something like TikTok, uh, anyone who uses TikTok will know how great it is at that. And you go, oh, wow, I love this golden retriever video. And then everything's golden retrievers. <laughs> um, and so- That's basically my TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just all dogs <laughs> um and so um yeah people then um fed in content and then more of that content then got uh whether it was true or not it's very difficult to distinguish it and then the people who engage with that content who might it might appeal to because they have a confirmation bias mm -hmm. they might dislike particular groups of society or they might have particular views especially if they're more 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 extreme then they'll find other people who like that and then they embolden and reinforce that views because it's normalized because they read the comments and then they have conversations with people and they find these other groups and communities and then the platforms themselves then show them and suggest other groups and communities that they should mm. join because of xyz and so i think uh, back in yeah, 2016 when we sort of slept walked into as a londoner you know waking up and slept walked into in, into into 
Brexit, whatever mm. your political views, I think a lot of people were very surprised. Yeah, I, I, th- I think the, the surprise kind of illustrates the lack of understanding of the echo chamber in terms mm. of like, oh, well, we thought everybody wanted to sit within whatever whatever perspective you were taking. I think a lot of people were surprised. I think that kind of reinforces the belief that is being fed back to you in your echo chamber and your or your filter bubble or however you want to mm. kind of conceptualize it. Um, but obviously, yeah, we kind of woke up and the opposite had happened for a lot of us. And yeah. I think I actually, I was actually at Glastonbury and I cried. Oh. <laughs> I was probably quite underslept as well. It probably wasn't just Brexit, but I think the combination of the two things, it was just not a good moment. Um, yeah, and I think, but the inability, and I think what's really helpful is for you to actually unpack all of that and explain a little bit how it all works, because I think there is still perhaps not a general kind of understanding on exactly how echo chambers operate. And with the increasing political polarization we're seeing around the world and in Europe in particular, I think it's important for yeah. for people to be aware of. Yeah. And I think it's just essentially the platform's intention is to keep you on there. Mm-hmm. And to keep you on there, they'll feed you the right content and typically more extreme or salacious content, which people refer to as clickbait, um, will then capture your attention. And again, lots of content producers are very sort of uh, au fait at this and they'll be able to make videos and things to drive to, 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 to drive um, to drive usage and to, to drive an audience. And then essentially the platforms go great. And so then they create these micro communities and then they feed them more of this content. So then you say, well, does there need to be some flag? Because ultimately on the platform, things are flagged. So if there's some content which maybe um, is is quite horrific, you'll sometimes see this is sensitive content yes. and they will show them. And the platforms do censor a huge amount and and certainly Meta um, and, and Twitter and, and Google spend a huge amount of money and invest a huge amount of money making sure those platforms are safe for people, making sure there's guidelines and there's teams that are overseeing it. But there's also then where do you draw the line mm-hmm. because these platforms should shouldn't limit free speech that's a western western ideal yeah but then what responsibility do they do they have and also where do you draw the lines and the values so you want to say allow political debate to happen but also um um yeah you want to allow political debate to happen but it it is quite tricky for them to say yes or no so i suppose consumers don't necessarily know what's right and what's not what what's real and what's not real mm-hmm. yeah and so fact That's checking but i would say that f- from my perspective and i think the perspective of lots of advertisers the platforms do have a responsibility if they're monetizing the content if and the audience particularly if they're monetizing similar to a newspaper yeah, if a yeah, newspaper exactly. publishes a particular article and it's wrong they have to publish an apology etc mm-hmm. i suppose the platforms fall back on go well look we're not the content publisher we're a platform yeah, yeah, we're, we're not a publisher yeah yeah well that was what facebook have been saying forever to yeah. get out of everything basically yeah. isn't it can we just pause on harmful content because mm. you gave some amazing uh examples to my students earlier this week um can you just touch a little bit on uh what was the isis example oh gosh um yeah you're reliving uh, a moment that i sorry to trigger in. you again yeah, trigger a trigger horrible... moment in cold 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 chills so um yeah i was working at a big advertising agency gosh back in 2017 and um one i was running the department that uh looked after our clients investment in google and facebook and all the digital bit digital platforms that are quite famous and uh we woke up to the front page of the times saying big brands fund terror and um and i only got this because someone had there i I woke up and you sort of these jobs are very long hours and things and so woke up at seven or whatever and then by 7 30 i'd had a few messages and then yeah a few clients had emailed me and then i'd sort of gone downstairs to the news agent that was underneath my house and bought the times and was reading it on the way in on the tube and uh you opened sort of this double page spread the so it's the front page and then page two and three and uh yeah several of our clients were in there with their advertising and um um, a clever journalist at uh, News Inn had gone on and found some videos of sort of ISIS beheadings or ISIS recruitment videos. And then before the video on YouTube, there's something called pre-roll, which is the advert that appears before the content plays. So you search for the video and then you click on it. And then, you you know, in exchange for you watching the video, you watch this advert. And of course, then, you know, very famous car brand, very f- famous um other brands uh <laughs> maybe public institutions all appear <laughs> and and then this is screenshot and then they'd wrote this but the the challenge there was um 
Google's model isn't mm-hmm. that Google makes all the money. They've got a revenue share. So for all the money that you put in as an advertiser, whoever's uploaded the content, the video, gets 30%. So essentially, uh, uh, advertising agencies, and it wasn't just ours, it was, it was all the advertising agencies in the industry, were putting money on YouTube. And you were saying, great, I would like to target, I don't know, 18 to 45 year olds, uh, which is all fine and legit. And then that 18 to 45 year old was going on and watching the ISIS video. So there was no connection. And then 30% of the revenue against that video was Mm. going to ISIS. (laughs) <laughs> so it was essentially funding terrorism and 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 ultimately if we look at the power play behind this you know R- R- Rupert Murdoch and News and everyone else were pissed off mm. because uh, actually the decline in advertising revenue in newspapers had come mainly and was accelerated by social media mm-hmm. so uh, and YouTube and Google and they hated them especially so first Google come along and destroy your classified business which mm-hmm. is like all the ads in the back of a newspaper and then Facebook and um, and Twitter come along and destroy your uh, display business so all the adverts in the front of the newspaper and take your audience so there, there, there was definitely motive there sure um, yeah. but, but yeah point. it's, it, it's essentially Essentially, like um, uh, some tricky times, and then as advertisers, of course, we stopped. We just pulled pulled everything back, and it took a while. Um, but yeah, uh, Google did the right thing and um, changed the controls that you have on the platform. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot more choice that you have as an advertiser around what you can and can't appear against. Um, but ultimately, the pl- the content on the platform isn't necessarily removed. So there's a lot of things, and you'll have seen in the news a few years ago around, say, beheading videos and things. Yeah, that that that's that's content is flagged and taken off the platform, and and that's really good. And so there is extreme content, but you can't regulate everything. No. So there is lots of content on there still. So there is a question of does say a platform like YouTube or a platform like Facebook have a responsibility to its users to make sure that the content isn't there and do they need to go beyond community guidelines? Mm. Um, But certainly having talked to some people who've worked in these review centers where say um, you as a user find something quite offensive and then you report the content, Mm -hmm. which is then self-reported, the people in um, um, uh, in those jobs don't last there's a reason those jobs are outsourced to third party companies and yeah. not to the platforms themselves because it's horrific. It must be awful. It's just yeah. just awful. Yeah. And people don't last in that job. But then actually when when we did um we, we met a few of them in in a role a few years ago, um, when all of this stuff was coming up and saying, Oh, look, we're doing all of this stuff here. Meet, I don't know, Jane from Ireland who sits in the center, it's just the hollow behind the eyes. And then yeah. trying to talk through, well, when is I don't know, self-harm content, for mm-hmm. instance, when is that okay? okay and when that's not okay how do we regulate this speech because um actually is someone crying for help yeah. and actually they post that and will then their family see it or their friends and then you know do that or if we then hide that and mm-hmm. stop that so it's really hard and and i i don't know where it should stop i just know that as somebody that's doing advertising on brands you want the platforms you are on to be safe for mm-hmm. consumers and you want it to be a safe environment for your brand to appear yeah i think it's it, it speaks to that kind of core challenge of the free speech versus the censoring or the moderating or regulating and who's responsible for that and i mean in my opinion it should be the platform that is moderating but of course you know that in and of itself is a huge challenge but ultimately you know there is a responsibility if they're going to enable that content to circulate then they should be responsible for removing it is is my opinion yeah and 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 i think the calls that the task is too big to deal with Mm -hmm. is bollocks yeah yeah because um if i put an advert up for um say women's uh, underwear and you even show a slightest bit of sort of your uh, bottom on a high-waisted pant the computer will flag it and say no if you use a word um, for say cosmetics where you go oh a popular um p- popular traditional treatment for i don't know this was i don't know this herb or this ingredient it will ban it so the computers the, and you can appeal and you can do everything else but the can the the sort of um the ai that's controlling this or the machine learning that can go through can filter th- hundreds of mm-hmm. millions of adverts and it can go through so there is also a bit there where maybe there's a point of verification and um then a user needs to user needs to say no look this meets my community guidelines but i think the difficulty there is whilst we don't have an identity 
It's, it can't be the platforms by themselves. And I can't believe I'm saying this. It's the most illiberal thing I've ever said. <laughs> but but like we, we probably need to think of putting some responsibility onto the users and what they say. And I think actually if there was a way to tie someone's identity or you know someone had to Do you take mean the response. user that's generating the yeah content yeah exactly or, or whatever content so is. so i'm not saying we should all put our driving license into 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 facebook and google but there needs to be something which where users can take responsibility for some of the harmful content and actually some of the ills of the internet especially when it's to do with health and you know uh, trolling uh, mm. and you see all of this all, for all this news th this week around all the mps and that what's being mobilized against them yeah um would people behave like that if it could be tied back to them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure they would. So there, there is something in me which is like, yes, the platforms can go so far, but there's also maybe a holding a mirror up to ourselves mm. and thinking, is this acceptable behavior or are we happy as a society to have people behave like this on the internet? And yeah. this, this level of anonymity is maybe not always positive. So it, I, I, I wouldn't say the blame is all on the platforms. I'd say the platforms can do a lot more, but I still think yeah. us as individuals or society need to also have a think about what we want the internet to be yeah. and how we do that. But then... I, I do agree with that. But then I guess I also come back to this kind of ideology that we had um, Dr. Sula Wingesson on, the health psychologist, talking about this idea around, you know, if we see a lot of negative or harmful content, it fosters, what do you call it? It was mean world syndrome or something like that. And so, you know, I, I, would, I would say, yes, on the one hand, I do think we need to have some agency ourselves. But on the flip side, if you throw in the behavioral economics and the way the platform is pulling us in and and then promoting and making certain content that's very clickbaity visible. Yeah. We know what is the stuff that goes viral is the shocking stuff for better or worse. And then you have a load of users or individuals who are living through a mental health crisis and, mm. you know, another recession apparently and whatever. Um, and then they're seeing a load of harmful content or damaging content. You know, you're almost like, where where do the parameters exist? Like, who's responsible for what? Like, it's an absolute shit show, yeah. <laughs> frankly. I don't know, it's just very difficult to to segment and be like, well, they're responsible for this, you're responsible for that. I do think that the platform has to do more, yeah. definitely. Yeah. I think that's kind of, for me, that's a fundamental. But it's incredibly difficult to disentangle the web that we're yeah. kind of tied within, I think, online. And 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 I suppose there's, there's also the piece around sort of whether you're an adult or a child. Yes. Which I think Very actually important. the platforms have done a huge amount on when I was um, uh, back in the early days, we could advertise to people who were 13 or 13 15 um and it was amazing there were four or five hundred percent more 13 year olds on the platform than there were in the uk at the time and that's because kids were on it and they were mm -hmm. all saying they were 13 and of course like there were kids there and there was nothing that people could do nothing that the platforms can do and you see it now you know um, young relatives have have tiktok on their phones and and that exposes and opens them up to a world. But I think actually the platforms now, its it, most of them you can't advertise to people who are under 16, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, so they're not seeing adverts and they just have the platforms with the content themselves. Mm. So it, commercially, it's not there. But then the types of content that's on there, you know, it's a nursery for addiction because yeah. you're suddenly on there. And again, you've got this new sense of freedom in this whole new world and aspect of your life. And you, you know, you're discovering yourself and discovering who you are and who your friends are. And so if you're lonely and isolated, you can go and find people. But if you're popular, et cetera, you can't. And, and it must be so difficult. I'm so glad I didn't grow up with any of so, 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 social media. Yeah. But it's quite terrifying. But I think the platforms you see are doing things to help mm -hmm. children, but also are they doing things to get them addicted? Yeah. And so, um, and, and can our young brains cope with this almost um, change in, yeah. um, uh, change in, oh my God, I'm going to just consume content. And we used to see it in advertising. So older people would scroll slower. So we were like, why Why are older people they really engaging with our the viewability of our ads? So how much? <laughs> and we were going, great to advertisers. Oh, great. You know, like, we, we, this is brilliant. But actually, you look at it and then you segmented it by cohort. And it's just because younger people are flicking through the content Because they faster. want those dopamine 
Yeah, and their brain responses. maybe can process faster, etc. Sure. But but like you like the quantitatively, you could see that, and um and so yeah, uh, now we, young people will just go. Can we just touch on the uh, the neuroscience of that? Because again, you we've discussed this before. You mentioned about the differences between uh, digital media and non digital, or, or like you know more traditional media and mm. new media in terms of how the neuroscience literature around that and the kind of insights into behavioural science. Could you just share a little bit on that because it's really interesting? Yeah, um, so. So if, if you think about advertising, you're trying to capture someone's attention and that's going to, of course, be through the creative. So if you uh, uh, you might use a celebrity or you might use comedy or you use something. So the creative is everything. And a really good advert, I was lucky enough to work with John Lewis for years and, you know, in the height of all their famous Christmas ads. And it was something that people loved and you're making something that's really positive for the world. So I don't think advertising is necessarily um, all negative. Um but um, essentially, uh, when you're an advertiser, you want to capture people's attention. So you sort of want to create something we call brand salience. So it's ultimately like, oh, I have a perception of this brand. So I'm aware of that brand. Because if you're not, and then you walk into a supermarket or you're online and you see it somewhere else, you're not going to pay attention to mm -hmm. it because you don't know what it is. So you sort of introduce the brand and get people to become aware of it. And then you want it to mean something to them. And so you can do that through emotional advertising or mm -hmm. you can do that through rational advertising. Like, oh, there's a discount. You know, my double cheeseburger is only one ninety nine this weekend. And so there's a mix of these emotional and rational messages. But behind that, you know, there's an awful lot going on in our brain. So going back to sort of our monkey brain and our human brain, um, we've then got that computing and we've got so much coming in, the brain is sort of taking that stuff in. So we take all these signals and then we can process our world around us in a faster way. And so for advertisers, you're trying to get attention. And back in 2012, um, the big thing in um, advertising was to move money out of television because television is a, was is a like it dominates the market, um, takes most of the advertising revenue, mm. and it was very difficult to negotiate and sort of it's, it's basically a rigged system. And so the the aim of the game was to take money out. And so we there were lots of studies done comparing how people's brains are engaged in neuroscience studies, how people's brains are engaged when they're watching TV, you know, sat down in a social environment, mm -hmm. and then how they're engaged when they're consuming content on their newsfeed. So the first studies were just a desktop newsfeed, and then it went to mobile newsfeed. And what was always fascinating about these studies, and uh, and I thought they'd all been brushed under the internet, but I found some, uh, uh, I found some by just go Googling it the other day, was that the areas of the brain responsible for emotion attention and memory were all scored much higher. So in neuroscience, I think they just see, I don't know, the electrical activity in the parts of the brain mm. and then they index it. So when they compared TV um, to social media, uh, social media was much better. When they compared social media to newspapers, it was much better. And so you go as an advertiser, wow, you know, people are paying more attention, they're more emotionally engaged, and they're paying more attention. So great, I'll then have more approach motivation. Sorry, that's a jargon. Approach motivation. Um, approach motivation. That's the biggest bit of bullshit I've, uh, I've heard, <laughs> but that's what it was termed. So, so yeah, you, you've, got, you, you've got more likelihood to persuade someone mm -hmm. to take action and to do what you want. So to buy a product or visit your shop. Uh, if you put the right message in that context. So if you put a shit message, it's not going to work, of course. But if you've got the same message on, say, TV as on a social media platform and you expose those people, then they're more likely to take the approach. And so these studies, I suppose they've gone out of vogue like they're not in fashion really because I've not seen them for 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 a few years um but ultimately they always stuck with me and it's something that me and my mm. team used to go oh well, look this is why you should put put your money here uh, which was the name of, which was the name of the game um and so yeah I, I I think people have known about it but for us you know I I get it you know you're watching TV you might be in a relaxed state of mind and that also might be good because mm. we might be watching TV together and you know something comes on and and it's a shared funny experience and that would be good for a brand and so TV is very good for brands as well uh, at building sort of fame uh, and interest but ultimately this very personalized experience because my brain is I'm, I'm taking it in more mm -hmm. but I think now maybe the platforms have taken a bit too far because 
back in 2010 when we first put the news feed as an advert in the news feed i was i was telling rachel this the other day um we did the first ever ads in news feed and uh, the first comment was fuck off out my news feed uh, <laughs> by a consumer and then well, within, exactly well received <laughs> yeah well yeah well received but actually some of the content which some of the adverts which was quite good like movie trailers um people quite liked and we didn't get the same comments and then after the first month it was one advert a day then it was three adverts a day then it was 10 adverts a day then it was an advert every three posts and so now what you've got is sort of a huge amount of advertising so actually it becomes wallpaper so mm -hmm. it's not as effective yeah so um it's a bit tricky and so maybe that's why they've stopped doing the neuroscience studies uh because the ads are actually a lot le less effective but I, I would say that it's there and 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 i suppose for us they were they should have been alarm bells for all of us kids working in social media back then in our in our 20s which is wow this is some quite dangerous stuff mm -hmm. because we're looking at people's brains and it's literally changing them okay so we've spoken a lot about the way that platforms kind of monetize our personal data and some of the kind of horror stories around privacy um can you just explain like today what you think as uh from the perspective of consumers what should we be worried about when it comes to personal data and privacy Wow, um, big question. Um, so I suppose it's more as a consumer, are we aware of how our data is being used? I don't think that there's anything too malicious going on. Uh, and I don't think that the platforms and sort of advertisers use data in a, in, in a, in a essentially an immoral way. I think maybe it's just that consumers need to be more aware. Mm -hmm. So an example of how we would use data today or how consumers have given permission when they accept terms and conditions. I don't think it's always laid out in a very clear way that consumers realize what actually they're giving permission to. Do you not think that's purposefully obstructive? Um, Sometimes. Yeah, I think it's maybe that there's not the regulation to make it happen mm -hmm. because certainly if i look at say email marketing now you know when you sign up to an email you have to tick the current terms and conditions where it says look you agree that i'm gonna uh, be emailed and then in some cases in some markets like say germany you have to then get an email and then you have to say yes i accept this person to send me emails so the regulation can be put in place by the government i think there's a lack of regulation here but um I, I don't think the platforms and the advertisers are using it in a difficult way and i don't think that anyone could actually identify oh it's you rachel so, however mm -hmm. all this data that is used is pulled on you so um, when you go on to Google and you're looking at the local supermarket to see if it's busy at this time or the zoo or wherever, and there's that little graph on the phone which says, oh, it's busy at this time. So all of that data is passed back. Mm -hmm. And then I could use that as an advertiser as a signal to essentially go, oh, I'd like to find people who go to that place. And so do consumers really know that the phone in their pocket, which is really useful and you want to see where it's busy and you want to see the opening times, do they really know that, you know, the, the Google Maps app on that is passing back data to Google? And yes, no one can ever tie it back to you, but it's sort of grouped and mm -hmm. pulled together. And then equally, you know, things like when you go on a website and that annoying thing comes up, the cookie banner, and it's like, do you accept the cookies? And you're like, ah, oh, yeah, I don't care. That essentially puts a bit of code uh, on your device and then it monitors what you do and it passes it back so for instance if you're working with a retail company it might tell you oh great yes this person saw the advert and then they came to buy something and that's relatively benign i can never tie it back to a particular person but where it then starts to get a little bit i don't know may maybe a bit dubious is when you've given a company your email or when you go into a shop and they say oh would you like an e-receipt you know it's convenient you know or you might get 10 percent off your next order or something uh so you give your email address um that data is passed back and i don't think then when you're in with the shop assistant in in whatever the store is by you're, you're buying something i don't think it's explicit there which is we're going to share this we're going to share your email back with Google and Facebook and TikTok, et cetera. And then they're going to be able to use that to, you know what, know that maybe 
you'd seen these adverts in the last few days and that you know it's resulted in a purchase so for advertisers it's really good for us mm -hmm. because we can then say oh this advert this message was more effective than this message which is great but actually do consumers know is it explicit that they know no and there are very few use cases and i think it is actually quite simple to explain yeah which is well, like, you explain you know, it brilliantly but i don't think that any terms and conditions i guess when i say purposefully obstructive that's what i i mean is in mm. terms of the language the layout the design like the whole way it's constructed you're just like yeah whatever yeah you know and it's and who's going to take the time and even if you did take the time would you even understand it probably not because i feel like the language is purposefully kind of makes it difficult to understand yeah. and i think that is i find that very problematic because i think that is uh yeah not okay yeah it's not okay it, yeah I, 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 th I think it's not okay and i suppose it would be lovely to see regulation happen as it has in california and it has it happened in in europe with gdpr which does govern around how some of those pieces of data can be used so um that's that's very good but i think some of the the how we could be more explicit with that information mm. both brands and which are if on a website etc within the terms and conditions could be better but the platforms also need to do a good job yeah because the privacy center for you to then control whether these this data can be used in this way and whether they can match it back is so far hidden you can't do it whereas actually that maybe needs to be front and center it needs to prompt you to go through and in and in very simple language say are you happy for this to happen? Because I think if it did that in simple, yeah. before you could then Actually get in to look, look my... at your next TikTok yeah. or look at your next Instagram session, oh, are you happy for brands to track you from their stores? Oh, no, I don't like that. And mm. it's just something very simple as a survey that could be really good, but it's not in their commercial interest. Yeah. So actually, they're not going to push this agenda. And the government is so far behind, they're never going to catch up. Yeah, that's a good, it's an important point. And we'll come back to it. I just want to ask, do, can we, I mean, I call, we live in a surveillance society. Can we ever challenge that? Can we ever have agency over our data in any way from your opinion? If we want to exist, if we want to have a profile or a presence on these platforms, which you, which you do because, you know, you, you want to socialize or your friends mm -hmm. or your social network do or, you know, it's entertainment or something that's useful, then you don't own the data. Mm -hmm. Like that that's the challenge. And the law is that the platforms own the data. I think in the EU, you have the right to be forgotten, etc. Mm -hmm. So you yes. can go in and you can request that the data is removed from any digital platform. And they will they will go and go and do that. But then you can't access that platform. So short of setting up a sort of fake identity for yourself, probably not. And so how uh, the only way to do is to opt out, but I want to search for things and yeah. I want not to. But then but, you can't participate and then yeah. there are, that has direct impact on how you live your life and the conveniences that come with it. And huh. I guess that trade-off is your privacy. And is there anything we can do about it? I don't know if there is. And I suppose it's like, what what do we mean of as privacy mm -hmm. and maybe uh, you know, being a child of the eighties, I think differently about privacy as maybe being a kid now. Mm. Who, um, uh, and thinking back to the example of the Facebook apps, you know, we all used to just click yes, and we didn't really know the power of our data. And so maybe there's a piece here where you know there needs to be some education around what data is mm -hmm. and 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 what the control is, as well as some regulation around how your data can be used. Again, in collaboration with the platforms to make it more more more, more specific but um uh, how we can control our data we can't yeah. it's 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 owned by someone else you, you made an interesting point about kind of being an adopter versus a native do you feel because i would say that we having having not grown up with it and then adopted it like for me it was in my late teens early 20s i think when facebook became available in the uk when i was at uni that we have more of a, gr a greater or a lesser concern about privacy because I, I would argue that we have a greater concern over privacy yeah. and that the younger generation, like my students, for example, this is a hot topic in most of our seminars um, across the modules I teach. Most of them don't care. They're just not bothered about privacy. Um, and I find that fascinating that they're just like, well, why should I care? I've got all this amazing stuff I can use largely for free. And the trade-off is to them is just fine. They're yeah, the trade-off is to them. And I suppose we've not seen data be used in a malicious way really apart from you know the poster child of cambridge analytica which mm -hmm. was able to 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 use that data to identify a cohort so i suppose people think what's the danger 
in this. And I suppose the danger is, you know, these platforms are commercial and there isn't the regulation to protect the data or they get hacked. And then, you know, yeah. someone's got your profile and people have their identity stolen all the time. Yeah, or especially when it comes to health data and that, you know, Ooh. thinking about like period trackers and the reversal of Roe versus Wade. And we've discussed this on yeah. earlier episodes. But I think, but also what about if the platform is capturing all your data tailoring everything to your preferences so brilliantly and personalizing it that it makes it increasingly more addictive then mm. do, do you, would you agree with that as a statement or would you um, contest yeah, it yeah I, th I, th I think there should be what i would love to see what i would love to see from the platforms is you know i'm happy to dial up or dial down the algorithm yeah that would be really nice you yeah. know just something so that a user was in control so you could maybe see some other perspectives. It was interesting, I think, Meta, after the whole um, Russian involvement uh, in, in the elections, um, uh, changed their policy. So now when I advertise on there, I think every time we advertise, we have to sort of click the button to say this isn't political and you have to flag whether it's political content. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, then they wanted to say, oh, well, look, we'll show a more balanced view. So then they were showing, say, maybe some right-wing content with some left-wing content or left-wing content with some right-wing content. It didn't work and it doesn't happen anymore. And why? Because it made the platform less sticky. Yeah. So then they lost users. And so- When you say uh, sticky, you mean oh, attention yeah, to on keep, the platform. To keep the platform. So basically someone going, oh, this is boring and turning their phone off mm -hmm. and that's monitored. So how many yeah. times you pick up your phone and open the app and all of those things. And they'll look, the guys, that develop the the, the 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 feeds they are monitoring that and that is looked in big cohorts and a company like facebook will have um ten thousand cohorts with different algorithms running and then they'll then work out which algorithm's more sticky and then mm -hmm. they'll roll those elements out to the other ten thousand the other nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine and then they're constantly evolving and met multivariant testing to make these platforms stickier or mm -hmm. more addictive yeah so that they can sell more more of your time stuff. and and i don't know is it i think it's maybe quite 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 yeah it's should we be in control of that probably but also we need to maybe be able to put the things down maybe they should but then be... if they're designed to pull us yeah. back here i don't know it, I, i'm not yeah. saying either I, I agree with you it's they we're tra ever traversing mm. that like the 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 design of the tech to pull us in and our own kind of self-regulation and discipline to detach and they're at odds with one another every day all yeah. day <laughs> basically i think aren't they and, and it's weird when apple is then the like vanguard of privacy and so <laughs> apple and google yeah. are having this like fight off to be like oh we're, we're the people that are looking after people's privacy and i'm not sure if i necessarily believe either of them no um but but they are you know the uh, apple wiped all the tracking that you can do on the app so facebook share price suddenly went down because they couldn't do all of this stuff anymore but then facebook then developed a bit of technology so that advertisers can just hook their computers directly into facebook's computers and bypass that mm -hmm. so like the companies are finding a way around and the regulation isn't catching up but yeah I do see that sort of um, Google now is removing all of the tracking that you, you know, you, where, you, where you click accept. That won't matter soon if you use Chrome because it just Chrome wipes it all anyway. So the Google is making advances into your privacy to, to essentially protect our privacy. Apple have made advances into that and continue to. Mm -hmm. So it might be a situation where, you know, these companies actually become morally enlightened or maybe it's from self-interest because they want to destroy their competitors, but, you know, morally enlightened and, and actually do come to our protection. Mm -hmm. um, does that then mean we're living in some anarcho-capitalist society <laughs> where actually the government is no longer relevant in this digital space? And so, yeah, I've, I've really, re I, find, I find that idea really fascinating. That is very interesting. That actually the people that are protecting us are these two companies, not, not the government. But, the big but, is though then they set the prices and then you have a monopolistic ecosystem and of course the case that i'm leading against apple at the moment obviously speaks to some of those issues and i think that because of the securitization argument that apple you know are very good at um promoting uh i'll say it diplomatically <laughs> um uh but then because you've got a closed ecosystem then they can ensure that you only have an ios app store on all apple devices which means that they're excluding competition this is what we're alleging in our case yeah. um in the uk um and therefore 
they can then set whatever prices they want, which largely is around a 30% commission, right? And yeah. that we're arguing with our collective action that that's anti-competitive and that that is, uh, it's not fair. And it's the yeah. consumer that's getting passed on this rate of commission and therefore it's the what that's where the 1.5 billion in damages is what we're mm. seeking. So yes, if you say that, well, they've got these securitization arguments and we operate within the platform and they might be protecting our data. But if you're more entrenched into an ecosystem that is monopolistic um, and closed, then are you not becoming more entrenched in a system which then makes you, it's less competitive. Yeah. So therefore you have less choice or agency because the prices are determined and set by the monopolist that you're stuck in. So, so, so the challenge here, and this this debate came up a few years ago, I think it's so interesting because um, Google got too big. Google got too big. And, you know, it's 97% of the world searches in Western Western countries. 97%? 97% wow. go through, through through Google. So, of course, every time um, that's, a, that's a monopoly. And so, you know, Microsoft's got Bing. Yeah, great. Um, uh, and you try and break Google up. So what do you do? You could take away Google Maps. You could take away Google Search. You could take away, you could make them sell off all their shares in Uber and whatever else. Uh, you could separate YouTube and break that up from a competition point of view or you could split it into two search engines and say great you know you're going to now compete against each other the thing is consumers will want the search engine which is going to work best yeah. because you're searching for something so you go okay great oh brilliant this search engine works much better than the other one so you're going to use that so it instantly becomes a monopoly again mm -hmm. so you can't actually break these things up so when you talk about monopolies it's true like there are these ecosystems which are generated and created and it's very difficult for me to move my identity from my mm -hmm. iPhone to something else. So actually, do you know what? Oh, I'll just buy another iPhone yeah. for increasingly more money every year. Um, even though they oh yeah, even though they don't work very well in terms of integrating the data and things. But but yeah, so so you can you can't break these things up. So actually uh, all the rules and regulations that we have around capitalism are defunct because you should, you know, you think back to the big oil companies, mm -hmm. they were all broken up and they were divided yep. up. But you can't divide these digital companies no. up. And so there will be, I think there's this there's this um fact that we need maybe some new thoughts around how we think of the economy in digital. And we need some new political and regulation around it. Oh, but also big then questions, but they're good questions. But, but then you've also got this huge power play between Chinese led mm -hmm. and American led companies yeah. and this distrust and gosh, we don't want to use we don't want people to use TikTok because they've got a back door into the Chinese government. Well, I'm sorry. I don't believe that people don't have a backdoor into the Western ones. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, like um, it opens up a huge amount of questions. And then you go, well, who isn't really in control of our data? Because is it the government? Um, oh, God, so interesting. I wish we had longer. <laughs> uh, okay, right. So I do want to just touch a little bit on regulation or lack thereof. Um in the absence of effective regulation, as we currently stand at the moment, largely when we think about our personal data and consumer practices online, um, you mentioned, uh, we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but you mentioned about consumer protest in the lecture that you mm. gave earlier this week being directed towards brands being an effective force able to challenge digital platforms. Can you just explain mm. a little bit about that for the listeners? Because I think it's really uh, just an interesting perspective on the pushback, I guess. Yeah. So if, if we look at some of the protests that are happening or people trying to change change the direction of digital platforms you've of course got um the 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 terribly sad case of say molly russell and her father who's a campaigner mm -hmm. to remove content and he has um gone about that by um raising his profile raising the profile of the case and challenging and taking to court and doing it the legal route and then the platforms, I think only last month, um, Facebook and Twitter um, agreed that they would remove sort of self-harm content and they would make sure that it wasn't shown on the platform. So that's been going for several years. Um, but um, that's slow. That's really slow. Mm. Um, but um, in my time in uh, working with big brands, I saw immediate change in some instances. And the immediate change came when we stopped advertising. And when we stopped advertising, the brands stopped advertising, then the platforms changed the uh, changed their policy. So the example was there was this great uh, movement in 2013 called the Everyday Sexism Project. And the Everyday Sexism Project would go onto Facebook and they would go onto a particular page, which could be something horrific like 
punch that bitch in the face until she's black and blue or um yeah they're like a homosexual's place is dead at the bottom of the stairs so some really horrific content toxic and horror. horrible toxic content yeah and um and then the adverts would appear on the side because of course you're targeting the person you're not targeting the content and so they had tried to speak to the platform speak to facebook speak to twitter to get this content removed and to no avail uh nothing happened so then what they did was they then screen grabbed it put it on twitter and then they said oh hey why x brand are you advertising and condoning this content so then that of course gets picked up and then the brand director is like oh my god I don't want my brand to be associated with this hateful, disgusting content. Mm. And so then they, they're like, turn off. Then, they, you know, you get a phone call and it's like, turn off all the adverts. And so then you turn the adverts off. And then, of course, the person at, at, at Facebook or Twitter phones you up and is like, why have you turned all the advertising off for X? Like, that's how I'm going to get my commission at the end of the month. And you go, well, look, there's this hateful content. And so in those instances, advertising was removed. Mm. Uh, I think the platforms could have done more in those instances to maybe remove all the content but they did but they stopped monetizing the content immediately and so they were the changes which then affected the platform immediately so i think cons as consumers we still have um power by essentially not lobbying the platforms because we're just one of loads of people and they don't they don't care but if you lobby the brand that you're a customer of yeah because we are the product on the platform, so they don't really care. We're like, they've got millions of us, but actually we're the customer of X brand. And so if you write to them and you know take some screen grabs or email them or speak to their customer service, and you do that in enough mass, you can then change you the direction of the change. platform. Actually, actually affect change. But I, I don't see any other way that you can do it yeah. rather than you know there's a mass exodus from these platforms, which isn't going to happen because they're so networked and addictive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's. I just think it's a really interesting example, isn't it, of like yeah, reclaiming some sort of sense yeah. of agency and power, like you know a little bit. Um, okay, I think we're kind of there, but we yeah. always like to finish our episodes with a uh, top tip from our guests to share. Um, and for yours, I'd love you to share just kind of one takeaway where you can share with our listeners about how we can maintain some kind of agency or think a little bit about our relationship with the marketing that we engage with uh, when we're navigating different digital tools every day. Oh, wow. Um, so in terms of the marketing, I think it's just being aware and looking for the signals on the platform that something is an advert and you know advertising above the like um above board advertising that you see from big brands is heavily regulated so you can't lie and you can't do certain things i think we all know the impact of influencers and really just questioning some of the things you see on the internet about brands or people endorsing mm. brands yeah um brilliant. and and yes whilst whilst people should say oh yes it's an ad or i'm, I'm associated it's not always necessary really clear so i think it's just questioning that and that i'd say more just generally for our health is setting timer on your phone on these apps yeah. so you know great um it's amazing you set the timer for an hour and you go oh, i'm never going to spend an hour on instagram each day and then you're halfway through the day and you go oh wow it's timed out and and just having those prompts for yeah. your own health and sanity to realize that puts you more in touch and then and then finally for i suppose all, all of us is to review your privacy regulations on the platforms to yeah. go into the terms and conditions and the settings and really just go deep and, and have a look um, and do that. And then the other top tip is if, you, and, and as an iPhone user, I did this a long time ago when you're following people around, around and seeing, using their location data, I didn't feel comfortable with that being passed to all the yeah. apps. So I went on to settings and then uh, buried deep in, in your iPhone is location services yeah. and just turn them off yeah, yeah, because yeah. you're literally passing all of your data. So so I suppose from that, but yeah, a a advertising I think is is enjoy it because it is, it is heavily regulated, but just being aware that, you know, your brain might be taking it in in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. That's just so useful. And I, yeah, you've kind of touched on the one thing that I was going to say, which was just just be aware of that surveillance and turn yeah. off those location services. And I think one thing that I also say to my clients is always also just like have a little uh, digital cleanse, like delete mm. all the apps off your phone and your devices every so often that you're not using on like a weekly basis because yeah. you just don't need them on there. It's like digital noise. It's like disrupts, you know, your, your kind of your brain. You've got it on there. You're more likely to to go on the apps and services when they're kind of you know they're inaccessible i think just turn it delete it or turn it off i think just to try 
try and maintain some kind of privacy and a kind of detachment from it. Yeah, and there'll be this new wave of technology which comes anyway over the next few years, which hopefully will free us from some of these and technology more more in with our flow and our mental flow. Mm. And I'll, I will welcome the day. Yeah, that's a nice positive note to end on. Henry, thank you so much. Pleasure. Um, it's just thank amazing. You. Thank you. Thank you, so thank you for listening to Digital Health Diagnosed, your dose of tech wellbeing. We're here every episode to give you tips and strategies to manage your everyday relationship with technology. Please remember to like, follow and subscribe across all the usual channels. I'll see you next time.